all the readings. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce uh, our speaker. And um, I didn't get to speak to him very much before the meeting because I was going to ask him how to pronounce his name. I'm just going to say it's Jorge, and then I'm going to tell you a George Carlin joke. I think Jorge means George, right? George, is that your other name, Jorge? So George uh, Carlin says that he hated having the name George Carlin because he never gets done spelling George. It's G-E-O-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-O-R. -E 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 anyway, that's my George Carlin joke for the day. Anyway, Jorge, I'm looking forward to hearing you tonight. I have heard a lot about you in the few minutes that um, before the meeting, so I can't wait. Bring it on. Thank you. Recording in progress. Uh, good evening. My name is George. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking Eric for giving me the opportunity to be of service. And uh, it's good to be on a Zoom meeting with some of the people that I haven't seen in who knows how long, in less than a year, but it's been quite some time. But anyway, my sobriety date is July 7th, 2009. I have a sponsor. Um, more importantly, I've gone through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've been constantly reminded that just because I've gone through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I need to incorporate them into my life one day at a time to the best of my ability. Um, I still come up short and not perfect, but I, I try every day I get up. I'm, giving a, I'm, I'm blessed every day I get up to try it all over again. And, you know, grateful today that my day is not consumed with thinking about drinking. Um, and, it was, and, it, and it wasn't like that when I first got here. So just to share a little bit of, of what it was like and what it's like now, um, just as a kid, uh, I thought my life sucked. I thought my parents sucked. Um, my father died when I was five years old. And, you know, I, I, I was given some information that my father was a great man, that he fought in World War II. Uh, prior to him passing away, he uh, wrote a will out. And that consisted of my mother uh, was able to take care of me and my sister um, throughout our whole childhood. And she never worked. And so as a child, as five years old, I was mad, mad at my dad because he wasn't there. I was mad at my mom because she was always there. And that's how my life went on. And that's, you know, my perception of life was already screwed up before I picked up the first train again. Uh, really not going to talk, you know, everybody always says that. I'm not going to talk much about the drinking and what it was like, but, you know, the, my life really never amounted to anything, you know. I heard a speaker say one time, my mother raised me right, I just didn't turn out right. And, you know, my mother, she, she laid some things down, go to church, go to school, you know, everything's going to be fine. And I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do any of that. And direct result of that, you know, I, I was introduced to alcohol um, somewhere around the fifth grade. I started dabbling with it. Um, one time I, I had a little, I still remember my little uh, Tom and Jerry lunchbox and I had a thermos and my mother had friends over the house and I, re I went around and I started grabbing the half empty, half full beer cans and I filled up my little thermos and I took it to school the next day and I told my friends that we we're going to drink some beer at lunch and uh, they were all like, okay, okay, let's, you know. And probably we had one friend that said, why wait till lunch? Let's start now. And, but, you know, we never got to drink that beer when lunchtime came. And uh, I opened up the thermos and I had three teachers haul me off to the principal's office. And I, I still remember the attention I got that. It could have been three people in that cafeteria, you know, saying my name, saying I got caught with beer. But it sounded like everybody was saying my name. And uh, my mother came to school that day, come pick me up. They called her up and, my mother's thing was every time the school would call or anybody would call in, in reference to me, she would always say, no speak of English. And my mother didn't really speak a whole lot of English, but she really understood English. And, and when she understood it, the school was calling, she know they, they weren't calling to say I got perfect attendance this quarter or I, got, I made honor roll. They knew I was in trouble. 
and she would come to school and she would, you know, she would, she would give me a spanking and take me home and spank me at home. And, and by five o'clock, I was back, back outside playing in the dirt and, and uh, not because she said I could go outside and play. I just hit the door running. And that, that was, that was, that was my childhood, you know, getting a spanking was a severity of my, it was my consequence for my actions. And it just went on and, and my drinking started to progress. And at, at the age of 15, me and a bunch of my friends, we had, we had got somebody to go get a bunch of wine for us. And it was the good stuff, the Wild Irish Rose, the Thunderbird and the Mad Dog. And we drank one bottle that night and we saved the rest of it for the following day. And we went to school and we, you know, we didn't go. I don't know. I don't know why, but in our childhood, we spent a whole lot of time going to school, not to go to school, because you know we, we took the bus to school and then we went immediately to the woods, and uh, we drank all day. And and that afternoon, we got back on the school bus drunk, and you know we were being very disruptive in the back of the bus, and uh, the bus driver threatened to take us back to school if we didn't cut it out. And that's when I realized at the age of 15 that. I was already drinking to a blackout and I was becoming violent. And when when a, when a bus driver threatened to take us back to school, I told my friends, uh, let's beat the bus driver up uh, when we get to the bus stop. And, you know, I had the same friends from elementary school. None of them said, you remember that thermos from the beer? That wasn't a good idea. This really isn't a good idea. But when I get drunk and I and I come up with these ideas, I tend to I tend to do what I, I say I'm gonna do. And, and I came out of a blackout with the bus driver yelling my name, and I went into another blackout. And, uh, lo and behold, uh, I woke up in the grass at the bus stop. And uh, the following day, I went to school like nothing happened. Nobody told me, George, you shouldn't be going to school today. But uh, like a lot of my blackouts the following day, I'm, a rem I'm reminded about what happened the night before. And uh, I was immediately called to the principal's office. And um, I, I was informed that uh, that I hit the bus driver. And uh, the bus driver was in the office of the bus driver. jaw was wired up. Um, and I don't say that to say I hit hard. I just say that because uh, that's what happens so when, when I drink. I, I didn't wake up that morning and set out to go, you know, break the bus driver's jaw. That was, that was never part of the deal. And can you guys still hear me? Can you guys still hear me? Okay. And um, so anyway, the phone call to my mother was different this time. They told, it, uh, they told my mother they were calling the cops and, uh, and I was taken to jail. And I was introduced to a place and... And, uh, here in Sheltonham, Maryland, uh, it was a boys' home called Boys Village. And I stayed there for four months, and um, I was perfectly I was perfectly fine being confined to a small area with a bunch of guys just like me. And I got out, and I went right back to doing the same thing I was doing, not listening to my mother, drinking, running the streets. Uh, I never graduated from high school. Um, you know, I just like like I said, you know, it was like my mother raised me right I just didn't turn out right um my drinking started to escalate uh if it wasn't for alcohol a lot of things uh, I would never experience I don't think I would have ever experienced uh, like being homeless uh drugs became a part of my life you know like all these things became a part of my life because of, of alcohol uh, going to jail going to prison all these things were because of alcohol but I can assure you uh, alcohol didn't always play a part of, of me going to jail or going to prison. And I love it in a big book where it says that uh, alcohol is only but a simple problem lies in the center of my mind. Um, I, could, I can make a lot of bad decisions without alcohol. And uh, so uh, long story short, you know, it's like I never, I never amounted to anything. And, and towards the end, um, it was just bad. And I, I met a girl outside of a pawn shop. Uh, a couple months later, she got pregnant. And uh, we we're staying in like a $30 motel. We we're, you know, stealing every day so we could drink. And 
when my son was born, they found substances in the system that an infant shouldn't have. And Child Protective Services got involved. You know? And they, they didn't they didn't notify us that they were going to be watching us from here on out. But, you know, they just kept our son for an extra three days and gave him back to us. And, and we went on our merry way. And uh, we moved down to Charlottesville, Virginia, with my um, son's grandmother. Because, you know, there's... Uh, it was my, my son's mother's mother, and she's, this was her third child. And, she, you know, her mother said, you can't do this to another another kid. And uh, she said, let me take care of you guys and just come down to Virginia with me, and I'll take care of you all. And I got my little things, and I said, let's rock and roll. You know, um, and we went down there, and I was able to get myself together. I got a job. I got a car. And found a little house that we were renting. And... Um, and we weren't drinking like we normally was. And then one day, one of us said, you know, let's go back to Maryland and have a good time and come back. Nobody will never know, we'll go to work. And lo and behold, just like in the big book said, we'll set up conditions that uh, we can't meet. And, you know, we'll, 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 we'll start right back up exactly where we left off at. And uh, before you know it, uh, we kept traveling back and forth to Maryland for Virginia. And one day we didn't come back and we drove around for three weeks with our infant son in the backseat of the car getting drunk and, and partying and, you know, like just misbehaving and, you know, being driven by alcohol. And um, we came back and then by that time we lost everything we had gained. I walked away from a job. I walked away from the house. And uh, her mother was pleading for us to come back. And when we went back to her house, uh, it was strange that she wasn't home, but within an hour, Greene County Sheriff Department and Child Protective Services was there to take our son away from us. And it just got worse. And um, me and her got separated. Uh, and then before you know it, it was, my, my son was four years old. And, you know, that that's, that's like my life when I'm in, in the middle of alcoholism. Everything just zooms by. And, and I woke up one morning, 2008 Thanksgiving, and I said, I can't do this no more. And I called a childhood friend of mine up and he let me come live at his house for eight months. And in that eight month period, uh, I was able to rekindle a relationship with my son and his grandma. And she started to let me go visit. And I would behave myself long enough, you know, just to, just to act like, you know, everything was okay and, you know, a week before I got sober, I was on a Greyhound bus going down there to visit. And all I had in my mind is that I wanted to be a father to my child. Didn't know what that consisted of because I never had a father figure in my life. You know, from the time my father died, my mother never brought another man home. And, and I thought, I, I just thought she was a terrible woman, but I, I know she was a great mother today. And so anyway, I got down there and I told Mama D, I said, you know, I'd like to use your car tomorrow so I can take you to a swimming alone. And I had to ask those things because I'm a 39-year-old man that doesn't have his own car and I can't be trusted with my own son. You know? But in that eight-month period, I regained I regained her trust back. And she said I could use her car and I could take little George swimming alone. You know? Because prior to that, it was like we are on a field trip. And she chaperoned us everywhere we would go together. So that night I got drunk. You know, I set up a condition that built my son alone and I ruined it all by getting drunk and I couldn't stop drinking. And that, that next morning I woke up and uh, had a hangover and I knew I had to hurry up and get that boy together so I could go get some more to drink. And lo and behold, somewhere between 10 and 11 o'clock that morning, I drove for about 16 miles for about 20 minutes of complete blackout with my, with my four-year-old son in the back seat. And this is what I do when I introduce alcohol into my system. I can't even be a father to my child. Alcohol takes priority. And I came out of the blackout with a man on a bicycle bouncing off the windshield of the car that, that I was driving. And what I believe today, this is when God intervened in my life and said enough to know. And, uh, didn't stop me from drinking, but this is when I believe today that it's 
when God appeared and said, enough's enough. And I was arrested that day. I blew a point two eight. A um, couple hours later, later, the Virginia State Trooper gave me another breathalyzer test. And I uh, blew a point one four. And he said, since I hadn't given him any problems, he was going to get rid of the first results. And I've never had that kind of an encounter with a police officer. One, I always was... I was, I was always troubled when it came to a police officer. Uh, I was never calm. It was always, you know, it was the end of the world. And this time it was different. And he, he got rid of the first results. And I didn't know what was going on with him. But um, he said nine times out of ten I'd be released the following day. And, you know, uh, and I knew that wasn't going to happen because, you know, all my life I've been in and out of jail and in and out of prison. And on paper, I didn't look too good. And that next day, uh, lo and behold, um, the commissioner said I, they, he would have to be absolutely crazy to let me go on personal recognizance. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, like I act like like I didn't know what he was talking about. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, well, you got 24 failure to appear. It's like, that means you don't come back. And I said, well, I don't have any in Virginia. And he says, well, you're absolutely right. So, so if I give you a PR bomb, would you come back? And in my head, I'm like, this is why I got 24 fair to appear because you guys keep asking the same question. I give you the same answer. Yes, I will be back. And first time in my life, I, I, I came back because I ended up getting sober. But I, I got released from that jail that day. That morning, I was waiting on Mama D to come pick me up. And I'm standing outside that jail with the you know, I didn't know what it was then, but I know now it's the guilt, the shame, and the remorse. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get right? Why can't I be a father to my child? Why can't I stop drinking? And uh, Mama D pulls up and, you know, she says, George, are you okay? I love you. And, and one of the worst things you can do to me when I beat myself up is love. Uh, tell me I'm a piece of crap. You know, co-sign what I got going on in my head. And, but she said, uh, you know, are you okay? I love you. And, uh, and then she said, do you have any idea where my car is? Uh, I was like, no. And, but anyway, so, but deep down inside, it was the first time in my life that I truly felt that I didn't want to drink anymore. And by the time we got back to our house, I was drinking again. Uh, not wanting to, but not knowing how not to. And for the next three days, I continued to drink in. Uh, apparently I overstayed my welcome and uh, I had to come back home and uh, a childhood friend told me I couldn't stay at his house no more. Uh, he, my sister told me to come home to her house and I, I had nowhere to go and and uh, I went to her house and you know my, my brother-in-law was there and he wasn't very loving. Uh, he had some issues with me and uh, some things I have done to him and him and his family. And, you know, he basically told me that if it wasn't for my sister, I wouldn't be there. Uh, and between me and my sister is all we got. My mother died a year and a half before I got sober. And so she felt that, like, if I went back to the streets, she, she probably would never see me again. And um, so she gave me one more shot. And she used to be the same woman who used to fight with my mother. Like, don't let that boy in the house. Stop letting him in the house. A couple of years ago, my sister told me that, you know, she asked my mother years ago, like, why do you keep letting them in the house? And my mother told her, she's like, that's my baby boy. What do you expect me to do? And it wasn't until, you know, my, my sister had, had kids of her own and realized, you know, like, the love that my mother had for me, even though I was sick. And it was, it was putting her through the deal um, that, you know, my sister understands that now. She gave me another shot. And my brother-in-law told me if I wanted to stay in this house, I had to start going to meetings. And he told me in a very sarcastic manner, the three bicycles in the garage that I haven't stolen yet, pick one and start getting to meetings. And um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I was blessed. We went two miles from my brother-in-law and sister's house. It's a recovery club called Unity Place in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, I rode that bike the first day there. And um, there was an innocent guy standing out in front of smoking a cigarette, drinking a cup of coffee. And I, and I seen him and I, and I just took off. I went back home and I called my brother-in-law up at work and I told him, 
you know, hey, I couldn't go in a meeting because they wouldn't let me take the bike inside of the building and I couldn't leave it outside because you know what kind of people are hanging around there. And um, they told me, don't worry about it. You know, and I, and, I, and I like the, you know, like when people say in a program, it says, you know, like, we, we're, we don't take too kindly to suggestions. But I tell you what, if I tell a lie and you tell me don't worry about it, I will take that suggestion and run with it. And uh, so, you know, I, I told you, told me don't worry about it. So I laid down, went to sleep like I would always do all day long and, uh, you know, jump up and act like I was doing something once they come home from work. And when my brother-in-law came home from work, he had a Kmart bag with a lock with a bicycle inside of it. And he says, try it again tomorrow. And, uh, and at that time, my brother-in-law had 16 years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I'm grateful for today is that my, my brother-in-law never tried to, you know, like open up the big book, read it to me, shove it down my throat, do any of that. But anytime I came into his house, he always pointed me to the rooms because he knew like if he got me there, and I sat put long enough, you guys would do what you do. If I, you know, if I was willing, you know, and open to it and all. So I went back the next day and that same guy was standing out front, smoking a cigarette, drinking a cup of coffee. And he was like, hey man, I remember you from yesterday. Bring your bicycle inside. We got coffee and donuts in here. And, uh, and I, you know, I cursed him out and I'm like, you know, like why would I take a bike inside of a building? I got a lock for it and as I started to walk into that door, it felt like I was walking down a dark hall. Um, I was full of anxiety, and uh, it, what it was, I was I was full of fear. I was scared, but I I had no idea what was going to happen to me when I walked through that door. Before. And when I walked in there, uh, the childhood friend that I was living with for that eight months, his cousin had just got out of Father Martin Ashley rehab that morning, and it was his first meeting. And I believe that God placed him in that room to make you feel comfortable enough to sit in there for an hour. And me and him started to meet every day there. And, um, I would go there and I, I, I was just, I was a nuisance. I was a, I was a disturbance. I, I cursed at everybody. You know, nobody understood me. I just told everybody, screw you guys. Just sign my paper so I can go home. I'll see you all tomorrow. We do it all over again. And they told me, keep coming back. And, you know, I... I didn't sign up for any of it. You know, I didn't know what the 12 steps were. I had this old guy kept telling me I was wasting my time by coming around. If I wasn't willing to go through the 12 steps of alcohol's time. So he'd be honored and privileged to be my sponsor. You know, all these things. And I, I was like, why can't you just leave me alone? And, and, you know, and I would always say that. Like, I would tell people, why won't you just leave me alone? Woman Dale told me one day, she said, the day we leave you alone is the day you stop walking in that door. She said, you come in that door, you're asking for trouble. Right? And um, and like, still till today, they, they haven't left me alone. You know? But I'm a whole lot better than I was when I got here, from when I got here. And uh, so th three months into this, I finally gave into that old man. I told him, okay, you can be my sponsor, just leave me alone. And, um, he, uh, he said, that ain't, that's not what we do around here. And uh, uh, I'm trying not to knock nothing down, but he told me, he said, this is what we're going to do from here on out. This is not a living sober book. This is a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he told me, we're going to open up this book and we're going to start reading it. And uh, I would rather tell you that I was an alcoholic than um and face that man in a room alone and have somebody find out, find out that I couldn't read when I got here. And um, that still makes me feel some kind of way. And, um, but that man found out real quick. And, and I knew, I knew, he said, starting tomorrow, we're going to sit in that room and we're going to read. And I couldn't stop thinking all day, all night, off that next morning that like, I know he's going to ask me to read first. You know, that was like my biggest fear. And, uh, and sure enough, we got in that room after the meeting. He said, all right, let's start reading. And, you know, we got into the doctor's opinion and I started stuttering. I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. It just, 
I still to the day I think I feel he yelled at me, but he he told me he's told me in a in a kind manner. He's like, stop, I'll take over from here. But it sounded like he yelled at that man. You know, he told me I was just real sensitive when I got here. And, um, and, and what that man did for me, he started to read the big book of alcohol synonymous to me. He started to break it down so a guy like me could understand it. And his exact words early on, is, he said, I'm going to dumb this book so you, even you could understand. And I didn't even understand what he was saying then, but I, I got it now. You know, and, um, but that man, he started to give me reading assignments. He would say, here, read this, read this paragraph for one week. And when we get back, when we, we get together a week from now, we're going to talk about that paragraph. And there were some days, man, I would come back a week later. They said, what did you get out of that paragraph? I said, absolutely not. And I could just read it and read it. Like my comprehension was shot. And um, and it, it just started to break it down. And like, you know, so I could understand it. And I, and I still remember, it's like, we got to more about alcoholism. And it said, we had to, we had to concede to our innermost self that we're alcoholic. <laughs> so this is the first step, right? And then he says, what does that sentence mean to you? And I was like, well, what did it mean to you? And I said, because when I got here, you guys told me I did not, I did not need to know the answers to everything. And now you guys are asking me for answers. I said, so what does it mean to you? And he, he just, he just looked at me and said, you know, for once in your life, just tell the truth and just say, you don't know. And I said, okay, I don't know. Now what? He said, what? What don't you know in that sentence? And I said, that C word. And he was like, concede. And I was like, yeah, that one. And uh, he said, how do you not know that word? I said, because I don't talk like that. And, you know, for the longest time, I thought it meant, because I would hear people sharing that, you know, like I had to get honest with myself. And, and it's more than that. I, I had to get honest with myself about something I had been denying for a long time. And that, that's the definition of concede. And, um, so, you know, he, he helped me with that. You know, he, 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 he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He dumbed the book so that I could understand it. And he broke it down. And, and lo and behold, you know, like somewhere along the, the process of going through that book and going through the steps, uh, I started to get a little bit better. Uh, I wasn't one of those guys who did a thorough fourth step. I would like to say it was as thorough as it could have been because I didn't trust that man. And, um, for no apparent reason. I just didn't trust people just for my lifestyle. And so I just gave them the bare minimum. And so it was just as thorough as it could have been. Uh, and I have to say that because I've done more since then, several other four steps. So if the first one was thorough, I don't need to do any more, I just think. But because the definition of thorough is complete, you know, so um, I can go on and on and on with definitions and Thanks to my sponsor, he gave me a dictionary and so I started looking up these words. And uh, so I celebrated a year. I never told anybody that I was in a car accident. And the court dates started to pop. They started showing up in the mail. And I started to get real frog and real crazy again. And um, that, that woman, Dale, my home group member, she pulled me up after the end of the meeting one day. She says, George, what's going on with you? And um, and I told her I was in an accident. I almost killed a man driving drunk. And she says, like, she thought I had relapsed. And I was like, no, this, this, this happened a year ago. And she says, why are you just telling us now? I said, well, because I'm about to go to court. This is a good time to start telling people, you know. I don't just start, you know, I withhold information until it's ready to be, you know, put out there. I, I don't, you know, like, you know, a year from, you know, something is about to happen to start projecting. And uh, so she told me she was going to go to court with me. And, uh, and I, I wasn't that well. I was far from well. And I said, Dale, what, are you, what, what, are you, what is your husband going to think about this? And then she said, well, he's coming too. And I said, well, and then I was like, well, I'm going down the night before and I'm staying in a hotel. And I don't know what you and your husband got going on, but I don't get down like that. And she looked at me like I had lost my mind. And I was, she was like, what, what, what are you talking about? And um, so anyway, I realized I was really crazy when I got here. <laughs> I got people trying to help me out. I think they're trying to come on to me. And um, But lo and behold, 
uh, when it was time for me to show up for court, there were eight people that traveled four hours away, two days off from work, um, just so I wouldn't have to go to court by myself. And, um, and just so I wouldn't have to walk into a courthouse by myself. Uh, through the front door, and it was the first time ever I walked through the front door of the courthouse. And um, first time I was able to sit in court and look out and see people that I knew. And uh, you know, I, I, I you know I went to a civil case. They were suing me for they were suing me in State Farm for eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. I walked away paying no punitive damages. But what I'm grateful for today is uh, that the man basically recovered ninety nine percent. It was a near death situation, and uh, I, had, I had like six uh, misdemeanor charges, and they dropped them off. One felony charge with the malicious wounding with a vehicle while intoxicated, and uh, the, the DA offered me two years off, spent it for four months, and she said if I didn't take the deal, she was gonna split my head wide open. And um, and she told me that on the phone, and she sounded like. You know, like she was some like huge woman. You know, like the way she was talking, like she was gonna split my head wide open. And then when I first, the first time I saw her, she was this little itty bitty thing. Uh, she just sounded real mean on the telephone. And, uh, but I took the deal, and they told me come back in three weeks. The judge accepted the deal. They told me come back in three weeks to turn myself in, and I had never experienced nothing like that. And and I had the same judge for the civil case I had in the, in the felony case. And he already knew my story, that I was in the program, that I had about 18 months at that time, um, that I had a girlfriend, we were living together, I was paying bills, I had a car, the car was in my name, all those things. And he gave me three weeks to you know, get my priorities together and to come back and turn myself in. And um, three weeks later, I went to go turn myself in. And, um, for the first time in my life, I went to jail. I went to jail sober, and I got out sober. And um, my girlfriend was there to pick me up, and we drove down to Unity Place that Saturday afternoon. And Dale and Brian knew I got out that Saturday, that Saturday afternoon, that Saturday morning, and we got to Unity Place. Um, just a little little hole in the wall. It holds like 50, 50 maybe sixty people tight. And when we pulled up in the parking lot, it was like 125 people out in that parking lot waiting for me to come home. And um, when I get when I get weird, meaning when I start feeling, you know, feelings, I, I get angry or I yell, and I yelled at my girlfriend. I told her, park in the back of the parking lot, you know. But I didn't want nobody to see me cry. And uh, those people came to the back of the parking lot, pulled me out of the car. Uh, and I hugged me, walked with me home. And, uh, so I still remember all those things that people did for me when I got here. Um, I, I had this young kid that was hauling me around to meetings every day. He was 22 years old. I was 39. I came in in July. That August, he was celebrating his first year. This kid followed me home one day just to find out where I lived at because I wouldn't tell nobody where I lived. So he could start picking me up and taking me to meetings. Remember one day he called me up when I first found out he followed me home. He called me up and said, hey man, let's go to the Outback and you know, hit a meeting. And uh, I said, yeah, you know, uh, I'm not home. And um, he said, bro, I just seen you walk in the door. And then like, I go to the blinds and I peek out the blinds and he's out there waiting. And I, you know, like, I, and, I, and I told him, I said, you can't go around following people home, man. You know what happens to people like that? I said, but, you know, we're going to talk about that on the way to the outback, you know. And, um, but that, car, that, that, that kid showed me so much, showed me so much, you know, not just about, you know, recovering, but you know, in life in general. And uh, I ended up being the best man in that kid's way, you know, who would have ever thought. And. So now today, you know, this table that I'm sitting at right here right now is is is, is where I get um, so much pleasure. This table where I'm sitting at right now is where I sit with other guys that I'm able to read the book to, where I'm able to dumb the book to other guys because 
I got guys in my life today that can't read very well, that were just like me when I got here, you know. And I'll take them through the process and, you know, I can't believe the life that I have today. You know, like I had this malicious wounding with a vehicle charge and today I drive a commercial vehicle. And I'm hauling, you know, glass up and down the road and you know, at any given time, you know, like it could go bad, you know, but you know, right now I'm I'm I like to thank Eric once again for keeping me up way past my bedtime. You know, uh, I would normally be in bed sleep. I gotta get up at two o'clock this morning to go to work. And uh but this is what the twelve step is all about. We carry the message. You know, we ask to do something, we can do it. And it's not like something I do every night. And you know, the life I have today is like beyond anything, like the book says, beyond anything I could have ever imagined. You know, my, my language has changed. You know, I remember before I would, I would get a job and they had direct deposit. And then that night I'd be at the bank, like at 1201 trying to withdraw my money. Right. And, um, cause I wanted to go drink and today, you know, like I'm talking about 401k, how much I need to put into it. Where I'm, where I'm trying to, you know, put my money at, where I can, you know, make it blow up, you know, turn a dollar into two dollars, and, you know, all this stuff, and I, you know, like, I got people helping me out with it because I, you know, like, I think about doing other things, and it was like, no, that, that's that definitely not a good idea. So anyway, um, you know, I, I'm responsible for today. My son calls me daddy. And more importantly, I'm a, I'm a father to my son today. And, uh, my son turned 18 back in August. And Mama D told me, uh, she says, George is 18 now. You don't have to pay child support no more. And I've never been court ordered to pay child support. But it was just, a, I had some men in, men in the program that told me, you've been working for a while. It's time to start sending Mama D some money. And uh, I didn't understand that. I was like, well, she's not asking me for money. Why should I send her money? And I says, well, you're, your mother didn't ask your father to write a will out to take care of you, you guys for the rest of your life. So, you know, you said if you could be anything like your father, you'd be a good man. So now it's time for you to start sending some money home. And they gave me a little plan on how to figure out, you know, like how much, you know, they told me out of my gross net for the month, take three bills out that I needed to pay. Right. And, um, and they said, you take the rest of that down there to her and ask what did she find acceptable to receive and you want some more. And she came up with a number. I agreed to it. Anytime I got a raise, she got a raise. When I got income tax, she got income tax. You know, anytime I got bonus, she got bonus and all. And it, and it went on. So like not too long ago, back in August, she told me little George was 18 now. I didn't have to pay. And uh, I got I got a little upset about that. <laughs> it was like she was telling me what I could do or what I couldn't do and all. But I told her, I said, well, I wasn't around for the first four years of his life. So I think I still owe you four years. And uh, she started crying on the phone. And um, I said, why are you crying? And she said, none of her kids would have ever came up with an idea like that. I said, well, it's not an idea. It's just me being responsible and trying to make right for what, you know, for, for when I wasn't there. And so anyway, my, my, my son's going to school now. I'm helping out with that. And like, like, I just love this life. You know, a friend of mine told me, he's talking about love languages, which I don't know what they're talking about, but they say my love language is service. And, uh, and I, and I love being a service, you know, like Ryan was, you know, joking about it early. I work the crowd, you know, I, I will go wherever and I'm not walking away with me, not meeting people, people not meeting me. I, I, I love this life that um, alcohol is mine and says gift to me. And what I know today is that direct result of the 12 steps of alcohol is mine is I have a God in my life today. Not, not just a God that I believe in, but a God that I trust in. Right? And, and that's a big deal for me because, um, I mean, sometimes I still have those days where I, you know, I just like, uh oh, you know, you know, but it always works out. You know, it always works out. 
you know, just the other day, I was at work and my boss called me up while I was out driving and told me that a, a customer said I did something unprofessional. But it was it's something that I do with all my customers. They just rather be there when I'm there. And uh, so anyway, you know, I got a little upset about that. I was like, well, that was very unprofessional of them to say I was very unprofessional. And, and you know, this whole tit for tat. So I, you know, I went the whole day processing this. I'm about to go back to work. I'm going to quit. I'm going to get fired. No, I'm not going to do all that. I want. I can't wait to go make that delivery again and do it all over again and piss them off. And you know, then I got back to work and I just told my boss, "Hey, do me a favor, man. Next time somebody, uh, a, a customer has something, you know, not positive to say about me." Uh, please don't share that with me. Just tell me, make these deliveries during business hours because that was the issue. I made a delivery when they weren't there on non-business hours, but I do that with a lot of my customers, but they just don't approve of that. So, I mean, lesson learned. I just deliver it during business hours and I just keep it moving and all. But I was ready to ruin it all. You know, I was like thinking about quitting, thinking about getting fired just because somebody says something about me that, um, lo and behold, hurt my feelings. You know, I was trying to do right. They hurt my little feelings. And um, I don't know if anybody else has those feelings, but, you know, you hurt my little feelings. You know, I get mad and uh, I want to tear something up, but it doesn't happen that way today, you know. So, um, life, life, life has taken on new meaning. You know, um, I can't. So, I, I'll end with this one. Um, and, you're talking about spiritual awakenings, and uh, and, and it's nothing like what Bill had when he's talking about you know, the wind, this, that, and another. But you know, sometimes I go to Sam's Club, and I go in there, and I spend about three three hundred bucks, and it's just me, right? And, and I go in there, and, I, and I'm buying everything I want, I'm buying everything I need, you know, and and I'm walking that out, and I just realized that, you know, like, I just spent 300 bucks on everything I wanted and I needed, and, and I'm not paying attention to, like, how much things cost. Well, that's, you know, I could go here and save $2. I just I just get it all there, and, and it gets me a hell of a feeling because, you know, years into this, but before I got sober, I was never able to do anything like that. I was never, you know, like, I was never fully self-supported, taking care of my own, you know, and today I can, you know, my sister doesn't worry about me anymore, you know, and now she just calls me and says, ah, I just wanted to call and tell you I love you. And that's something that me and my sister never did, you know, before I got sober. And uh, so she's changing through this process because my mother never told us she loved us. She just showed us she loved us. And, um, and, and you know, because of this program, I, I, I share with others, I, I would, I would go to the meeting and all of a sudden I started telling everybody, hey, I love you, you know, hey, I love you, I love you. And someone told me, said, are you going home telling your family you love them? I was like, well, they know I do. You know, I was like, no, you need to tell them. And so I started going home and I, you know, I said to my sister one day, I was like, hey, I love you. And she was like, all right, you know, but she wasn't, you know, accustomed to that. And now she calls me and she says, I love you. And then she's starting to, uh, starting to trust more in God, you know, and because she will call me and like, I never told her about going to jail until a week, a week before I was going to jail. Cause she would have worried me half to death that whole year and a half about going to jail and worried herself half to death. And, uh, and you know, so anytime I'm, you know, I'm faced with a dilemma today and I share it with her and she starts to, you know, Hey, well, what about this, that, and another? And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's okay. God got this. It's going to be all right. It's, it's going to work out. You know, I, I don't, I, you know, you just got to trust in the process. God got this. And, and now it's all of a sudden it's starting to, you know, trickle into her life. And she's like, yeah, I know God got this, but I'm still wondering how it's going to work out. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I was, I was texting earlier with Ryan and, um, and, and like the people I got in my life today. You know, um, like, I would have never thought I had friends from West Virginia. You know, even though they're not from West Virginia, they just live in West Virginia. And I got this 
the show eight where it got the shuffles pictures and it's one of a couple of them from down there. And, you know, people that I've just met all over the place. And you like, before, before I got sober, my life was so, it was like I was trapped in a closet. I didn't go anywhere. And today I got like, I, I have some amazing people. I got all walks of life. You're like, we meet all different types of people. And like, and, I, and sometimes I still feel like I'm like this dude from jail who can't get right. And I'm hanging around people that are teachers and lawyers and doctors. And I'm like, how did I get caught up with two people? You know, and, um, but it's just a blessing. It's like, but just like Alcoholics Anonymous, doesn't care how smart you are, what race you are, what religion you are, none of that. You know, all we want is you, you know, it's, that's it. And, you know, like I, I finally found the love I've always been seeking. And, and all I want to do is give it back, you know. Some people don't like the way I give it back, you know. Uh, I tend to like to, you know, hug and kiss a man, but I, I kiss him on the cheek. I don't kiss him in the lips. But Eldon, I will kiss him in the lips because I know it'll freak him out, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think that's about it for me. And I, I just want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for letting me share.